Erev Tov Chavrin, I'm Steve Benoon. You're watching Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, and no doubt we'll probably run this on Israeli News Live later uh, during the weekend sometime. Uh, a message I feel like is really going to bless many. And, you know, of course, again, once again, we're going back into the issue of the two witnesses. But before you get those preconceived ideas, uh, I think you might really want to pay attention to the video. Uh, this is something we have found out in translation that Yeshua, Jesus himself, actually has stated about the witnesses, and it will certainly turn uh, on the tops of head many of these ideas that the two witnesses are, well, Old and New Testament, for example, or the two witnesses are... Um, uh, this group or that group, you know, there, there's a lot of that going on today because it's hard for people to believe that God would actually send two witnesses here in modern times, two individuals, two people that will die in the streets of Jerusalem uh, and really accept this as being so. And, uh, and of course, I often get to, as soon as I bring up the idea that it could be Elijah and Moses, uh, I get immediately thrown to me, Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm just going to really just kind of, we'll just start off there because I hate for people to get stuck on this. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Bottom of your screen right here. Uh, we can see that there. Let me kind of scroll up there. And so therefore, people always like to say, refer back to uh, Hebrews 9, and they say, well, can't be Moses because he's already uh, he died. He's not coming back to die again. But that doesn't work either. And I'll tell you why. Well, just look at verse 25 and 26, even if you didn't look at any other verses whatsoever. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth in into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often, who is the he? That is the Messiah, Yeshua, he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. The whole passage is referring, the whole chapter in fact, refers to Yeshua coming as a sacrifice for our sins, not many times, but only one time. And uh, that kind of goes hand in hand too when uh, they ask the question to John over here in Matthew. And I'll back this up just a moment before we get to verse 14 here. And Yeshua, they ask, says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what were you out in the wilderness uh, to see? A, a reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, uh, more than a prophet. Actually, I should have went further up. Let me back up a little bit further. I'm sorry. Uh, they were asking, John says, Are, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again these things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. What? The dead. Let's, let's mark this down here real quick. Oh, get my find the cursor in here. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Well, if the dead are raised, don't you realize they died again? You know, because some people, they get into the argument about Lazarus. Well, Lazarus, you know, it says that he was raised up uh, after he'd been dead four days and in the grave and rotten and everything. But, you know, there's no scripture that said that he ever had to die again. We could probably argue that over a lot of the apostles of Yeshua as well. We don't have a record of when they died. So that's a little bit not a good argument, right? So anyway, so cast down some of these ideas that you have because I have discovered an amazing insight in Yeshua's own words that I think might clear up once and for all. Not only the two witnesses are two men, but that it's Moses and Elijah. Let's get into the scripture and let's take a look at this as I, as I was saying. What caught my attention was I was reading the Hebrew Matthew of Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew, 
And I'll go back to that in just a moment there. But as we get down to this verse, 14th verse, uh, and you have to understand, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist till now, starting in verse 12, until the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied unto John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come. Which was for to come, excuse me. And this is the King James Version's translation of this. Uh, and they put it as John is fulfilling the Elijah that was to come. In other words, it was a prophecy showing that he was going to come, and he is the fulfillment of that. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, but whereunto shall I like in this generation? And he goes on into the other subject. But we see that Yeshua clearly identifies John as the spirit of Elijah. But I decided, wow, what, is, what would this be in the Hebrew Matthew? What would what is actually written there, Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew, which, by the way, uh, after Nehemi Gordon did a, a pretty deep research on this particular book, and he found a lot more manuscripts as well on uh, the Hebrew Matthew. In fact, he had written me and told me he had 28 manuscripts versus, the I think, the 18 manuscripts that were used to compile uh, Shem Tob's Hebrew Matthew. Nehemi Gordon, though, does clearly show that when you read the Greek text of the book of Matthew, we find out that the nuances and uh, the, the idioms in Hebrew are, are, are that are written in the Greek text don't line up properly. But if you look at it in the Hebrew version, they make more sense, which leans uh, the scholars to understand that indeed Matthew was a book that was written in the Hebrew language originally and not the Greek language. All right, and I'm going to play a little excerpt of Nehemiah Gordon in just a moment. But before I do that, I wanted to share with you first uh, what's on the screen behind me. And I may have to blow this up a little bit because I can probably tell. It looks like it might be a little bit small for you guys there to see this. But we may have to take and move the screen around just a bit uh, for you to be able to see what's going on here. All right, first we read here. This is the way they translated this on the English side. But I'm going to take with you and look at this in the Hebrew as well. Uh, looking at verse 13 and 14, for all the prophets in the law spoke concerning John. That's pretty provocative. Let's look real quick look at Matthew again over here. We'll go back to the King James Version. For all the prophets in the law prophesied, it puts here, until John. But it actually, in Hebrew, he says, for all the prophets in the law spoke concerning John. A little different, right? If you wish to receive it, Jesus says to, the, to those, his apostles, he is Elijah who is going to come. Now, in English, he clearly puts it in the future. Now, before you jump to conclusions, bear with me, because you're going to find out this dovetails with another part of Matthew when the subject of John and Elijah come up once again. And I've, I've used this many times in time past. But I'm going to show some things to you because you're going to find out that also in the Greek language, we'll find out that it is also in the futures, but the translators did it differently. Now, for all the prophets, okay, shachol, that means that all, hanavaim, all the prophets, vehatorah, uh, davaru, Al Yochanan. All right. The, and all in the law, they had uh, Devaru, which is they have written about John. So it's not, okay, it's not even like Matthew had it over here. They, the law prophesied until John. No. In the Hebrew Matthew, he actually is saying that the prophets. They had wrote about John. Amazing, isn't it? Now, then we come to the next sentence. And we get, we're going down right here to the end here. Uh, let me show you here on the screen here. Who uh, Eliyahu, all right, that he is, in other words, if you can receive it, ve'im, you know, if, taratzav, le kavolo, who Eliyahu, he is Elijah. Now here's the key part right here. 
you got you got the definite article hey right here ha ha atid okay ha atid is the word in Hebrew for future all right he is Elijah the future labo to come labo literally to come all right, so John's in prison fixing to be beheaded and Yeshua is saying here that if you, if you can receive it, here John is, he's in prison, Yeshua knows he's not going to leave prison, but now Yeshua is telling John he's going to come in the future. That same John, he said he's going to come. Now, does he mean by spirit, whatever? I'm not going to get into that. I'm just simply telling you what he said because it seems that it was a pretty tough thing to accept because Yeshua says, if you can receive it. Now, that's even in the King James Version right there. Watch what he says. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which is Greek for Elijah. This is Elijah. Now, they put on there which was for to come. Now, you're going to find out that what the translators did, they translated it based on doctrinal beliefs and not on what the Greek actually said. I'll show you that. If you go right here to uh, the Greek translation here, and let me blow this up for you guys. Uh, all right, Matthew 11, 14. Make sure we got this plenty big enough for you guys to be able to see. King James Version says, Elias, which was for to come. All right? But it is actually, if you take it in the interlinear version, Elijah, who is about to come. The, the very Greek word used here is a future tense. John's fixing to go die. He's in prison. He's about to die. And Jesus says here that Elijah is about to come. Oh my gosh, I mean, this, this totally changes the picture of the two witnesses altogether because before there were a lot of doctrines going on that, well, maybe it's really not Elijah and Moses or maybe it's not Elijah and Enoch. You know, there are camps. You know, you got Elijah and Enoch camp because of Hebrews 9. That's why I deal with the Hebrews 9 right off the bat. They say, well, you know, John, you know, uh, excuse me, Moses died, Elijah didn't, he's got to come back and taste death. They, 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 there's this idea that everybody's got to die, but yet clearly we read in the Bible too, there are those which are alive and remain shall not hinder or, or prevent or hinder those which are asleep, but which we will all be caught up together with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air. There's going to be some people that are, that are alive here that ain't going to die, plain and simple. Now, how are they going to go back and die? Uh, it beats me, but that's what some people got this idea, right? So, I, I, I can't agree with that. The whole passage of Hebrews 9, again, is about the Messiah. And did, did he have to die more than once? And the answer to that was no. He was only required to die as a sacrifice for sin one time. All right? Not to mention all the prophecies that have never been fulfilled yet by Moses. I mean, it's unbelievable the number of prophecies he's yet to fulfill that all deal with the second coming of Yeshua. All right, so now, let's go into this. I want, before I go much further, because I'm going to refer more to the Hebrew Matthew here in just a moment, I want you to hear Nehemi Gordon. This is his website, uh, nehemiswall.com. If you want to look it up, www.nehemia, that's N E H E M I A. Uh, with an S and then Walt.com, Nehemiah Gordon. Uh, he's a remarkable expositor on, on biblical matters, and I really appreciate the work that he has done. Um, you know, occasionally we've corresponded a little bit uh, by, by instant message, things like that. Uh, but anyway, I, and I really appreciate the work he's done with the Hebrew Matthew. So let me get right into this here. I want to play about three or four minutes here of what he's saying about the Hebrew Matthew so you can kind of gather what's going on here. This is uh, on the, the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew and Nehemi Gordon, Open Door Series 2, and it's on his uh, website. And I'm starting at the 1903 mark here. Listen to this. It was written in Hebrew, translated into Greek, and then translated back into Hebrew. And what I'm going to look for in the New King James, which is a translation from the Greek, is the word shalem, the Greek, or in this case, English translation of the word uh, complete. So please read it, ma'am, and, uh, and, and read it slowly, and listen as she's reading for the word complete, or something similar to complete. Yes. And 
Verse 35. Matthew 18, 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Did, did you all hear that? What was the word equivalent to complete? It wasn't there. It says from your heart. It doesn't say anything about a complete heart or a half heart or three quarters of a heart. It just says from your hearts. And that's a Hebraic expression, a complete heart. Now that key word, the key word that ties everything, you can sit down, thank you. The key word that ties everything in together is missing in the Greek. 5,000 Greek manuscripts and none of them have this. And this can't be a coincidence. This is the central theme of the parable. And what this proves is we're not dealing here with a translation from Greek. We're dealing here with an original Hebrew document that has these connections in Hebrew that are lost in other languages. Now, um, what I'm not saying is that every single letter and every single word in this Hebrew version of Matthew is what Matthew wrote in the first century. And that might sound like a little subtle technical dip. Like, what are you talking about? If this is the Hebrew original, then doesn't that mean every letter is the original what, Hebrew, Matt, what Matthew wrote in Hebrew? But, it, but think about it. Matthew wrote it uh, 1,400 years or 1,300 years before Shem Tov. Somebody copied, excuse me, before Matthew. Uh, Shem Tov copied it. That was copied and copied and copied many generations, and things may have changed over the generations, just like they did in the Greek. There's over 5,000 manuscripts of the Greek, and no two are identical. The Greek is still the primary text, though. Anybody who now, the one thing, though, and I appreciate what Nehemi Gordon is saying there uh, about the, um, the fact that it's a copy of a copy of a copy, but it's still showing the proof that uh, originally... Matthew wrote in the Hebrew language, and so therefore, what Shem Tov used is, of course, as he said, a copy of a copy of a copy per, per se. But then again, the Greek is the same, and also even in the Hebrew, we have no different. We have copies of copies of copies, and like even the Isaiah scroll in Qumran, there are two Isaiah scrolls found. One, according to scholars, has meaningful difference than the other, and even the one that is closest to the Masoretic text, we're still dealing with. Uh, I think it's like 2,000 different variants of uh, the Masoretic text and what uh, was found at Qumran. So yeah, there's, there's little things here and there that change, whether it be punctuation, spelling, and in the case of the uh, uh, Qumran scroll that, that it's easier to get a hold of, not the one with the significant differences, but the one that's closer to the Masoretic text, there's places in there where entire sentences are added to uh, that particular version to, as compared to the original, and that's because I've read it myself to see and I've discovered that uh, also. So I wanted to bring this in because Nehemi Gordon actually helps to validate uh, the Hebrew Matthew, and he does this in many other videos as well, so I really appreciate the work that he's done there. So going back, let's just quickly look at this again. In the Matthew, King James Version there, we find out that Elias, or Elijah, John is, as Yeshua is saying, Jesus, he says that John was Elijah, uh, which was for to come, which kind of makes it look like that he was fulfilling a prophecy that was current, which he was, he was, all right? I'm not going to say he wasn't, but in this particular sentence, he is showing that he's coming in the future, and we know this. Why? Because the Greek actually tells us that Elijah was about to come, that, he's, that he is the Elijah that is about to come in a future tense, and we also find this in the Hebrew Matthew as well, that he is the Elijah right here. Ha'atid ha ha is uh, the future, and it's literally the hey, and there's definite article, which means it is a future for sure. Uh, the future, labo, to come, in the future to come, that he is the Eliyahu, the Elijah, ha'atid. Ha Labo, he is the Elijah that is going to come, and even they translate that pretty accurately when they put on there, he is the Elijah who is going to come. So now they should have translated that Greek as a future coming Elijah, but they thought that it was a fulfillment of Elijah of Malachi 4, and it is in part, but not in its entirety. And that's why it's very important to understand this, all right? Now, let's continue on, though. Now, I want to take you over to Malachi, because what he's actually quoting here, Yeshua, he's quoting uh, the fact of the Elijah that's coming in Malachi chapter 4 in the uh, King James Bible. It is actually still chapter 3. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible, and I'll get into that in just a moment because we don't have a chapter 4, but it, it's just, you know, added verses there. Uh, so it is, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. All right? That dreadful day, by the way, is a day of vengeance. It is when God himself brings his vengeance 
because of the rejection of his word. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, many of you are going to say immediately, Brother Steve, wait a minute. That's applied to, you, to, to John the Baptist. It's actually in the Bible and it's in the book of Luke. Part of it's applied to John. It is only that first part right here, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Now, for years I used to wonder, what is the heart of the fathers, and who are the fathers, and who are the children when they get their, the children get their hearts turned to the fathers at a later time. This is John the Baptist's ministry, or the ministry of Elijah, I should say. In the case of John the Baptist, he was fulfilling one part of it. So I'm kind of a little mystified, is Yeshua applying that John would actually come back again? Or is it the spirit of Elijah coming back? All right, I've always leaned towards the spirit of Elijah because of the scripture of Elisha and Elijah. Does not the spirit of Elijah rest upon Elijah? Okay, that's just my thought on that. All right, but let's look at this though. Luke says here, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. No mention at all in this verse about turning the hearts of the children back to the fathers, only the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, It'll make more sense to you here in just a moment, and I'll show you why. Because, in other words, half a verse is being applied to John as the Elijah spirit from, from Malachi 4 is being applied according to, to Luke's testimony that Yeshua uh, is speaking about, that John was the Elijah that turned the heart of the fathers to the children. All right? But there's no mention of turning the children's hearts to their fathers. And of course, as I was going to say, I forgot to say it. The heart of the fathers was the coming of the Messiah. John pointed the father's desire. In other words, all the prophets, the prophets had spoke about the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah. And literally, as we read in the scripture, it was Elijah was uh, to prepare the way of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, get into that in just a moment, right? Is make straight the path for the Lord, all right? And, but yet the odd thing is, as we read here in Luke, and it's like only Luke, Luke is only applying half of the verse to John, which makes sense because Yeshua over here in Matthew, if you look at the Hebrew form of it, he is saying if you wish to receive it, he is Elijah who is going to come, now, I think what he's actually saying is the spirit of Elijah that was upon John is what's going to still yet come. All right? But I don't want to add words into the Lord's mouth. I'll just say what he says. Okay? Now, but here's where it gets interesting. If that's only half the verse that's applied to John from Malachi's prophecy, as we saw right here, uh, Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. Boom. Stops. That's the end of it. Not the heart of the children to their fathers. Where is another place in Scripture that we see a very similar situation happening? Isaiah 61. Yeshayahu. Okay. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the eyes to them that are bound. All right, now watch this. Verse 2 To proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. Yeshua read that verse 1. All right, let me just let me just highlight the whole thing for you. Yeshua read verse 1. Half of verse 2, and he closed the scripture and he said, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He does not read the second half in the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Why? It applies to his second coming. He is the one that brings the vengeance of Almighty God upon this earth for rejection. He is the one that will comfort those that mourn. Who is the ones that mourn? Those that had rejected Him 2,000 years ago. 
their children being here today living in Israel today that have come back according to the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 12 and they will look upon him whom they have thrust through and they will mourn everyone as a family lost their only son. Now I realize it's a compound fulfillment because John also applies that to the Jews of the day when Yeshua was being crucified. But we see it's a compound fulfillment because in the time of Yeshua, they knew what tribes they belonged to. According to Zechariah 12, they don't know which tribe they belong to. It's the house of David, the house of Nathan, the house of Shemai, the house of Levi, and, the, and those families that remain. All right? Interesting. But in this case, half a verse is still yet to be fulfilled. So therefore, Elijah has to forerun the coming of the Messiah in both cases to make Scripture fit, which is perfectly in line with Malachi's prophecy because Elijah's coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is actually the day we're living in now that's about to fulfill, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, which is what John did as the Elijah back 2,000 years ago, but... The other half of that verse, in the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. What do you know? That means he's going to, this time, John, when he was here as Elijah, he could only get the desire of the fathers, and those fathers wrote about him. Isaiah wrote about him. You know, <laughs> look at Abraham. You know, you want to talk about the heart of the fathers to the children. Abraham met Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem. The king of peace. The very king of peace. He met him there in the Middle East in Israel, modern state of Israel. And then he began to wander around and he began to say, I am a stranger in a pilgrim. And he wondered and he says, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Why? Because he met the king. And if he met Melchizedek, surely there's somewhere here, there is a place that is a kingdom of his. But he never found it. That is the heart of the fathers. Abraham gave that heart to Isaac. Isaac gave it to Jacob. Jacob gave it to Joseph. They all were looking. What did Joseph say? Don't leave my bones down in Egypt. Why? Because they knew that Yeshua was coming. They all knew he was coming. Abraham, he wanted to be buried there, right there in Hebron. So John, the prophet Elijah, comes and he turns their heart's desire, what they were looking for, the coming of the Messiah, he turned the heart of the fathers to the children. He was showing the children, here's their heart's desire. Here's Melchizedek. Here's the Prince of Peace. Here's the King of Salem. And they didn't get it. They missed it. So Elijah came once. But now Yeshua was saying he's going to come again as Elijah. He is the Elijah who is going to come. Not just the one that was there, but he's going to come. Wow. So Isaiah, half that prophecy was still left undone. And the day of vengeance of, of our God to comfort all that mourn. What is going to happen in Malachi? Before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I will what? Smite the earth with a curse. Mmm, now it's starting to get interesting. All right, so now we see Luke. Luke applies only half, right? Now let's move on. Matthew, now we're in chapter 17. Remember what happens here? All right, now, verse 10, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? All right? This is, you got to understand what's going on. Now Jesus answered and said to them, Elias, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. I've taught this one so many times with you guys. Right? Now what's going on here? If you remember, we go back up a little higher. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into a high mountain apart. And was transfigured 
before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his remnant was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Now Moses isn't dead, neither is Elijah. By the way, John the Baptist is already dead, in case you didn't know. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well. Please hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid, sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they had left, lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus char charged them, saying, Tell the vision of no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? See? They were, they didn't, basically what was going on, they didn't believe that John was Elijah. And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. See, Yeshua is showing two things here. He's showing that Elijah is going to come and restore all things, and then he turns around and applies the fact that Elijah was in John the Baptist, fulfilling half of that. Remember, that's what you got to really watch. Yeshua, according to Isaiah 61. All right. Let me let me let me let me let me see if I can find that real quick for you. I want you to see when this happens to him. All what is it? all eyes, all eyes. I think is how it's worded in the New Testament. Were upon him. Let me see, get down to it real fast here. There's a lot of ones. Oh, missed it here. Yeah, here it is. Luke. Chapter 4, verse 20. I don't know how. Let me, let me put this up on the screen so you guys can see this better. Because I want you to see this. I'll tell you what, I'll go to the Hebrew one here. Because we've already did this. We've already established that that applies to Yeshua. And that was in Luke. I'm sure you guys could probably help tell me where it's at. Because I forget. But I'll go back because I can't hear nobody. Luke 4, 20. All right. So we go to verse chapter 4, verse 20. We'll highlight it so you can see a little better. All right. All right. Now, this. then what happened? And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say unto them this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears and all bear him witness and wondered at his gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth and they said is not this Joseph's son See, he only read Isaiah, Yeshayahu 61, only half of it, to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure, closed the books, and did not read a day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Therefore, the spirit of Elijah that was to forerun the coming of the Messiah has to do it both times in order to be able to fulfill, fulfill scripture because one time Israel is blind, they're not able to see because he blinded them in order for the, for the gospel to be opened unto the Gentiles. They had to reject him or they'd never offer him as a sacrifice. Maybe that's a better way to put it. All right. And so now he comes, he returns back. But before he returns, Elijah is still got to come back because why? Now Jesus is telling us that Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, let me take you back to the Hebrew Matthew. 
That's in Matthew 17. I'm going to take you down. We're going to drop down in uh, the Hebrew Matthew, and we're going to go into chapter 17, because it also gives it a kind of an interesting look here. So let's just move down. All right. I love this one online there, and I'll put that in the in the section below the com or the description, so you guys can see this for yourself as well. Um, I've asked Nehemiah if he can. I think he has it on his wall. Some of the and I haven't been able to find out where, but Nehemiah's got the, the extra copies that he has posted on his wall. But I'd love to have the one that he has in Italian, uh, from, or excuse me, from Italy. That's in the Hebrew language. We would really love to have to see that one. Um, I'm actually wanting to translate the entire Hebrew Matthew myself uh, and because there are some places, especially in Matthew 24, where I don't believe the English is a very good translation. Uh, and little things here and there. So, all right. So anyway, so we get in here. We're down to Matthew. Where are we at? Matthew 17, uh, right here. And we're right around verse 11 is what we got to go to. So let me jump back over here to the Hebrew Matthew. We're going to get to verse 11. All right, here it is. I'm going to start verse 9. Jesus came down from the mountain and commanded them, saying, Tell no man the vision you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. His disciples asked him, saying, Why do the sages say that Elijah will come first? All right. Now, the sages doesn't mean that they were down there with the Pharisees talking about it. He's just talking about, you know, this is what they have written, that Elijah is going to come. Right? He answered them and said, Indeed, Elijah will come and will save all the world. I say to you, he's already come. They did not know him, and they did to him according to their desire. So they will do to the Son of Man. All right? Now, in our Matthew, we read that he will restore all things. The restoration of the word is what brings about salvation because with the restoration of the word, then we know what the truth is. And if you, if you, if you, if you, if, oh wow, what does Yeshua say? If you know the truth, then the truth will set you free, right? Oh, I got, we got to pull that up real quick while we're here. But let me, let me just real quick take you over here to it. Verse, verse 11 right here. Lehem, ve'yomer excuse me, amanam Eliyahu yavo ve'yashua ko ha'olam. Elijah, he will come. And you, oh my gosh, they didn't translate that right. Wow, I didn't catch that one before. Oh, wow. Now, I understand why they translated it the way they did, but it's actually not correct. Let's blow this up. Whoa, this is why I want to translate this book. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so he's saying here that Elijah, Eliyahu, Yabo, okay, Elijah, he will come. Ve Yeshua, ve ya, well, you know, ve, ya, ve, ve Yeshua, Yeshua, well, you can still say it and save all the world. But it's almost too like he's saying, and, and Yeshua will save all the world. <sighs> I don't know. I guess either way. You could look at it either way. Yeah, it's a technicality right there. It's not really the right way to spell the name Yeshua because the extra, the extra, uh, the Yod right here, which would be like it brings salvation. Still, nonetheless, it is the restoration of the word. He will restore all things, which is bringing Christ back to us, heaven's sakes. That's what it is to restore the word of God. All right, so my point being here is, is that what we're finding out in Matthew now is that Elijah is going to come, truly shall first come, and according to the KJV in the Greek there, and restore all things. Okay, so Elijah is still going to come no matter what. Even though he says Elijah has come already and they knew, knew him not, but why does he have to come and restore all things? Because what? Vengeance is coming of God. All right, now it gets more interesting. We're just getting started, guys. So the second time he comes when he goes to restore all things, what is that restoration doing? Now the now we'll go back to Malachi. Uh, well, this is actually chapter four, the, the last part of the verse there, but in Hebrew it's Malachi chapter three, uh, verse 24. But in the 
uh, English version, it would be Malachi 4, 6. And the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. There has to be that restoration. He's got to get the children's heart to believe on the fathers, their promise, which is what? Salvation, Yeshua. Oh my gosh, that's, that's why he's saying that John, he will save the world because he gets them to recognize that the Messiah is indeed Yeshua. There is a hope. And, not, and let me say this, when he speaks about Ha'olam, the world, we're not talking about Nephilim who are foreordained to condemnation according to the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 7, but we're talking about the fact that all those that are His, all that the Father has given me, shall come to me, and none of them will be left out. There's that final fulfillment of that prophecy right there. Now, I know I said I was going to go to something else, but I forget what it is, uh, so I'll just continue to move on. Um, all right, so now we did, we did Malachi, we did Isaiah. All right, now we're going to go into Revelation again. This is the prophecy of the two witnesses. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they, uh, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. All right, that's just, I don't believe that's like dragon fire. I believe it's like in the case when Elijah was here and the king sent the soldiers to try to capture him. He said, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down and devour your soldiers. Well, that's pretty serious, don't you think? Yeah. So it's what they say will take place, whether it be Elijah and as well as, in my opinion, Moses as well. Now, Moses, why? Because when, again, when we were looking over here at Matthew, uh, what is it? Is it ch this chapter right here? Um, Let's see. Nope, that's all right. It's, it's actually in Matthew 17. This is where Moses and Elijah appear before him. Now you got to understand, Yeshua is a representation of the golden lampstand that is written in both Revelation and as well it is written in Zechariah's prophecy. And the two olive branches on either side of that golden lampstand happen to be Moses and Elijah. Now that's clearly identified in Revelation's prophecy about the two witnesses, that they are the two olive branches on either side. Yeshua is standing there with his with Peter, James, and John on that mountain of transfiguration, and suddenly Moses and Elijah appear before them. And there, and Yeshua is standing right there between the two. There is the golden lampstand and the two witnesses. He was giving you the prefigure already. Now, Malachi also shows you that you're, you know, I mean, here it is. It's right here. Moses and Elijah. We're right here at the last day when the restoration is to come, when Elijah first came to restore the heart of the fathers to the children. Now the children is coming to do it, the children to the fathers. At the same time, Malachi is telling you, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Well, you got to remember, when Moses came down, what did God say to Moses to do after he came down to give them the law? He says, prepare the people, prepare them in three days. I will come down and make myself known before them. Moses is also has a job of preparation to make the people ready for the coming of the Mashiach. Now, in this case here, when God came down three days later, they began to cry out and said, let not God speak. Oh, let only Moses, let God speak through Moses. And then what did God say? He says, I'll raise up a prophet like unto you, speaking to Moses. He says, and when he comes, if they don't hear him, they'll be cut off. All right, now, but that third day, what is it about the third day, though? When Moses goes up there and he tells them, prepare, the, make ready, prepare yourself for the th against the third day. Well, if we go to, uh, what is it, Hosea, I'll jump over to, real quick to Hosea just to show you this, right? And Hosea, and forgive me, I know I speak real fast on this subject, and I'm very sorry about that, but if you go to Hosea 5 and then chapter 6 as well. Last verse, last two verse. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I even, I will tear and go away. I will... 
I will take away there shall be none to deliver. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their trouble they will seek me earnestly. I'm, I'm going to go and return to my place. That means that, that tells me right there that the Almighty had came down. The El Gibor, which is Isaiah chapter 9, by the way, when it speaks about the son that is going to be born, that he is called El Gibor. All right, well, God takes, he says, he's going back to his place until they acknowledge their guilt. If God is going to go back to his place, he must have been on this earth then. Ah, well, what do you know? And we find out also over in uh, Isaiah chapter 10 that the very God that is coming to deliver Israel is El Gibor. The first time we see Isaiah 9, 6, he comes as a child, a human being on the earth. Isaiah 10, he comes back again, El Gibor, to deliver Israel. Right? It gets interesting, guys. Ooh, maybe that's the one. Let me, let me look at that real quick for you as well. First, let's go to chapter 6. I didn't finish this. Let's go here. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us, he hath smitten, he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may what? Live in his presence. Let us know eagerly, strive to know the Lord is going forth sure as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter rain and the water at the earth. Oh my gosh, friends, do you not realize... The third day when Moses was there and he had given the commandments, first he broke the ten, but he goes up, God makes him right on the second time, he comes down, then God tells him, prepare yourself against the third day. That's the third day. And by the way, when, when uh, this is not speaking of three natural days, that's 3,000 years. Because what is it? In the third day, we'll live in his sight again. The house of Israel has been scattered for nearly 2,800 years. We're almost at the end of the third day, and he's going to gather us together, and we're going to live in his sight. Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud and as a dew that early passeth away. Why? We never can seem to keep the word of God, all 12 tribes. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the word of my mouth. Thy judgment goeth forth as the light, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What does Elijah do when he comes? Restores all things. He brings about what? Salvation. Oh my gosh, friends. This is absolutely marvelous. I, I, I can't even begin to tell you. All right, now... This is he that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness. By the way, that was also, yeah, that was another thing about John. See, John was preparing the way before the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, right? Now, also, don't forget, you know why we have so much trouble about the two witnesses today? Because right here in Psalm 83, everybody thinks this is a war. It's not a war, it's a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy of Esau and all these different nations coming against the two witnesses. Verse 4, they hold crafty counsel. Psalm 83, verse 4, they hold crafty converse against thy people and take counsel against thy, not treasured ones, that's not the right interpretation. al sufanecha Safon is the word for hidden. Your hidden ones, they take counsel. In other words, they're trying to figure out what to do about these two hidden ones that are coming back, these two witnesses. They don't know what to do about them. Well, they start off by introducing a lot of false doctrines so everybody gets all mixed up that finally the people don't even believe that there's two witnesses coming. So that when they do come, they hope that will minimize the impact of that ministry. Now, I haven't really given you the evidence of the coming of Moses for a second time, so let me just quickly do that. Let's go to the Bible. I want to take you first to the famous Exodus 15 psalm that Moses sings here. All right. It says right here. Az yashir Moshe uvane Yisrael et hashirah hazot leyehuva veyamru lemor ashirah leyehuva ki ga'a ga'o or excuse me ga'o ga'a sus verekavo rama beyom then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake saying what? Asherah, I will sing unto the Lord. For he is highly exalted, 
the horse sus not susim sus verekevo and his rider his vav with the cholam the cholam vav makes it his rider ramah beyom have been cast into the sea one horse one rider hmm. it sounds like the antichrist spirit that is coming on his own little horse but he's ridden different colors down through the ages but his last horse that he rides that pale horse he's going to throw both of them into the sea when moses goes down there and he crosses through the red sea there were 600 horses or 600 chariots so if there's two horses per chariot, that would have been 1,200 horses and a heck of a lot of riders. And Moses says he's going to sing this. He puts the whole event as a future event, but the Red Sea just passed. There again, why? It's the same thing with John the Baptist. Elijah was fulfilling two different fulfillments there. So is Moses. Now, I'll show you another one. All right, we'll go to Exodus, and I think it's in 32, chapter 32. All right, and this is where it's at too, right? And all the people broke off their golden rings. They made all this golden calf and everything, right? They turned aside quickly, sacrificing into this, this golden image. Now, let me just see here where it's at. Had the two tables of stone. Joshua thought it was a, a, a noise of war in the camp, but he still didn't even say, no, just, they're, bunch, they're just all messed up, basically. All right, he breaks it, grinds it into powder, and Moses said unto Aaron, what did this people do unto you that, you that you have brought a great sin upon them? Right? Now, let's, let me find it here. Here we go. And Moses said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, for every man hath been against his son and against his brother, that he may also bestow upon you a blessing this day. All right, wait a minute. Let me see. Mm. All right, no, it's not actually in that chapter there. Ah, the one I want to share with you. I'm trying to remember where it's at. Um, let me see here. Ah, uh, it's actually 34. Chapter 34. All right, so let me jump over real quick. Okay, this is something that is yet to be fulfilled. This is another one why I believe Moses will return. We look at verse 9. I'll start with verse 9. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do they, again, they put on here marvels. Nifolot is the Hebrew word which means wonders. Such as have not been wrought in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you. That is tremendous. Observe that which I am commanding this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall break down their altars, dash in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their Asherim. For thou shalt bow down to no other god, for the Lord who his name is jealous, is a jealous God. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, they go astray after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods. And they call thee, and thou eat of their sacrifice. Thou 
uh, take of their daughters and to thy sons, and their daughters go astray after their gods, and make thy sons go astray after their gods. Thou shalt go, thou shalt not make the wait, wait, let me back up. All right, so we're going to jump over to chapter 34, and I want to drop down to verse uh, 10. Now, it appears that God is speaking to Moses about an event that is going to soon happen. Uh, and I'll start with verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If I now have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let, let the Lord, I pray thee, go in the midst of, the, of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. This is God now speaking to Moses. I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do, they translate the word marvels, but it's actually nephilot, wonders. In all the earth, nor uh, in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people, excuse me, back up, such as have not been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you that is tremendous. Now you have to understand Moses, with his brother Aaron, went down into Egypt. They parted the Red Sea coming out. Every kind of plague you could imagine was brought upon the earth. But no time after that did God do such wonders with Moses ever again. We had the splitting of the rock, the waters that came forth. But nowhere did God actually fulfill this passage with Moses that he's going to do in the sight of all the people. Even though he says as he goes down, he's going to drive out the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite. He does that through Joshua. But he says to Moses, he said that he's going to do with him, personal pronoun with him, these wonders that have yet to be fulfilled. But when we look over at Revelation, I'll just say this in closing now. We look back and we go back over here to the book of Revelation. I'll have to back it up. Uh, I think I already moved out of the book of Revelation. When you look at Revelation in chapter 11 here, there's a very interesting thing about the two witnesses, and that's the signs that they do. These have power to shut heaven that it, shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over the waters to turn them to blood. Now, Remember, we have the former and latter rain. I believe that's the rain that will be shut off. Those that will have the ears to hear will get the latter rain, but those that do not have the ears to hear will not get the latter rain. The former, by the way, the former and latter rain, which is the, the former rain, is the teaching that came down during the time of Moses. The latter rain is the teaching that came down in the times of Yeshua when he was here, Jesus. And John has bore witness of that. And of course, Moses and Elijah bore witness to that. But they also have power to turn the waters to blood. Moses, that was his gift. To smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Moses and Aaron came down and did all kinds of plagues. But it's not going to be Aaron with Moses. It's going to be Moses and Elijah because Yeshua has clearly identified already to us. In the Hebrew Matthew, he shows that he'll come and save the world. Elijah's forecoming in chapter 17. And if we go all the way back up to um, let me get over here to where I can see. And here we go. And we go back up to chapter 11. We're going to find out the same thing that he will do. Again, it says that Elijah that Elijah himself, who is going to come, and in the Hebrew, coming in the future. The Greek bore record of that as well. So if we could receive it, John was the Elijah that is still yet going to come. How it all dovetails together. I trust this message is a blessing to you. And I trust I haven't made it more confusing, but I trust that I've made it clear to where it makes sense. Yeshua clearly identified in Matthew eleven fourteen 14, in the actual interlinear, Elijah who is about to come. They translated it, making it look like he had, you know, John was just fulfilling the Elijah prophecy of Malachi 4. But see, the earth didn't burn up back in the days of John. 
We're living in the day where the vengeance comes in this day. Yeshua in Isaiah 61 reads only half of verse 2 because the other half deals with his coming of vengeance, which burns the world up. So everything fits together, just like locks in together, like cogs on a wheel. I'm amazed by it. I trust it's a blessing to you, and we thank you for watching. If it is a blessing and God lays it upon your heart to help support the work that we're doing, please do so. You can visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, and you can donate online there, or right below the monitor here at the end of the video here is our address. Uh, and we thank you for your support and your love to this, towards this ministry, as well as your coveted prayers. Uh, we certainly need your prayers. Thank you very much. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, Danoon Institute of Biblical Research, Erev Talk.